Thanks, Simon. Well, there's no shame being number two to guys talking about pythons and bars. I mean, it's like the perfect combination. You can't compete with that kind of talk. I'm glad he's not here this year. Or is he? Yeah? Yeah? You, oh, no, fail. <laughs> there goes my plan for world domination. Anyway. Right, so thanks for the introduction, Simon. So another Simon, in the long line of Simons in Python. Um, my name is Simon Ratcliffe. Um, I sort of wear a number of hats. I put up the hat slide just as an excuse if the talk kind of lulls and I've lost my mind because I've been doing too many other things of late. Um, so for Meerkats, I'm the technical lead of scientific computing, which is all very grandiose and doesn't mean anything really. Um, the SKA project, which I'll talk a little bit about, is a you know this really big, mega telescope. And uh, for that, I have uh, the dubious honor of being the system engineer for the science data processor, which is mostly pushing papers around. Um, there's also the DOME collaboration, which is a, a research sort of topic into exascale computing um, being run uh, in Europe with uh, Astron and IBM and a whole lot of other bits and pieces. But anyway, that's not important. What is important is to prepare. So, prep, launch, right. Let's begin and see. Let's get a reasonable size cluster. Okay. Uh, let's just make sure it's gonna work. You never know. Ooh, seems okay. So of course, you know, we have these grand ideas, these beautiful demos, and uh, you only discovered the night before that the default AWS account only limits you to 20 instances. I was like, I'm gonna do a thousand instances, a thousand nodes, people will be falling from the trees when they see my demo. And I'm like, go launch, 20 nodes limited. I mean, you can mail AWS, but it takes three business days for them to respond. So, you know, maybe they'll respond immediately, like in the next hour or so, and then we can do the demo. Anyway, that's happening in the background. So, enough of that. On to astronomy, which is, of course, not Python, but that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, in the beginning, a long time ago, there was bang and all sorts of stuff happened and we were right at the very end there, that little tiny like pixel sliver on the right hand side there. That's us, that's the whole history of human development. Basically where we are now, you know, cold fusion, jetpacks, flying cars, well, it's probably a rounding era, so a little bit back from that, but you know, we're still like a pretty cool time. But it wasn't always thus. As, you know, humans we've had some hazards to deal with, you know. I particularly like the picture of the guy with like grapes growing out of him and like volcanoes and snakes and you know, that was like properly trying to get to work in the early days, you know, you had to deal with these hazards. Um, but, you know, as time went on, the volcano settled, the snakes disappeared, we killed off the saber tooth, shark octopus got bad ratings and went back to the netherworld. So we started to overcome these, you know, impediments in, a, in our sort of getting in the way of doing interesting things. And so with our free time, we started to look upwards and look at the heavens and think, what is this all about? All these beautiful stars flitting around us, you know, what does it mean? <coughs> And it was really the Babylonians who kicked off the whole thing of astronomy and actually doing useful things with looking at the sky. Um, this particular example is uh, kind of known as astromagic, which is actually a cool field. I'd like to study astromagic, it sounds fun. Um, essentially, you know, this, whoever did this could sort of do some predictions and then use that to uh, go to you know, the landowners and say, ha, ah, I can tell you when the clouds are gonna come, when the rain is gonna come, etc., cetera, um, based on my studies of the heavens. And uh, that sort of, you know, helped us on for a long time. And, you know, this, this basic visual observation of the universe um, helped us understand a lot about what was going on. But we needed a, a kind of a next step forward. And um, that's because if you look up the night sky, and you, even if you go to a really remote place, so this is a picture of our, our site in the Karoo, obviously it doesn't actually look like that, but, you know, we've got a nice Stellarium plug-in which makes it look cool. You can go there, and even on, the, you know, the best night, you can only really see about 20,000 stars. Now, given that, you know, our galaxy has 100 billion, a 20,000 star survey is a pretty small drop in the ocean. So, what we need is to develop something better. And so along comes Galileo, commonly known as the guy who developed the telescope. Actually, what he did is he bumped into a guy called Hans Lippertie, who was a Dutch optician, saw the telescope and said, ha, I can sell this and then I'll give you some of the profits. So he went back to Venice, he patented the idea, he sold it to the court there, got a huge increase and lifetime tenure, etc. and poor old Lippertie died in poverty, probably. Basically, Galileo took someone else's idea, made it wildly popular, made a lot of money, so he's pretty much the first Steve Jobs. Sorry, <laughs> um, Moving on from such controversy, you know, things progressed, people built bigger and bigger telescopes. I always talk about Johannes Sibelius, those people who were here last year will remember me banging on about him. But what I like about him is he just built these insanely big things. He built them so big that they just fell down and broke. But uh, I think that, you know, sort of secretly pleased him that uh, there's such destruction going on. So we get to kind of today, um, where we stand. Uh, this is a picture of SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope in the Sutherland. And uh, 
you know, we can see an appreciable fraction of the universe with optical telescopes. And we can see amazing things. We can see, you know, a picture there, Centaurus A, uh, you know, that's a whole galaxy, you know, hundreds of billions of stars there. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that we can kind of routinely see this is, uh, is pretty amazing. But the thing with optical astronomy is it's only a little tiny piece of the puzzle. If you look at the visible light bit in the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, we really are not seeing a lot of what's out there. So we need to go further. And that's where radio astronomy comes in and other types of multi-wavelength astronomy. But what's particularly interesting about radio astronomy is if you look at the picture in the bottom right there, you'll see if we didn't look at this thing with a radio telescope, we would just see the galaxy there. We wouldn't see these massive jets of gas the same size as the galaxy itself coming out. And so that kind of gives you a, a little hint at why we need to do these kind of multi-wavelength observations. There's a downside, though, with radio astronomy. And uh, the clue with radio astronomy is to look at our units. So our unit of flux is a Jansky, which has a 10 to the minus 26 watts in it, which is uh, pretty appalling. Um, the picture below is just some, some typical sources that we look at. Those are actually Miller Jansky. So, you know, it's like 10 to the minus 29 watts. So that's a big problem. The other big problem are the baddies, of course. You know, we look at these sources that are very weak in, in the sky, but we have things that are interfering with us. The sun, 10 to the 5 Jansky, so, you know, eight orders of magnitude above what we're looking at. Someone standing with a cell phone at one kilometer away, 10 to the 8 Janskys. If you have an iPhone, it's fine because the battery's flat anyway if you're using iOS 7, so <laughs> no problem there. It doesn't hurt us at all. So what do we do? Then we need to think about scaling up and scaling out. That's to build our telescope. So in the 30s, we had these kind of quite small, tiny dishes, <coughs> things got bigger and bigger, we moved them away from civilization to avoid the baddies um, that were interfering with our observations. And this is what we built in the Karoo. So this is the idea of scaling out your telescope. Instead of building one big massive one, which if you build it too big, falls over, and I've showed the fall over picture so many times, I thought, well, I can't tell the same joke at like every Python conference I ever go to. So it's time for some fresh jokes. Um, when you hear a fresh joke, please let me know. I don't know if I actually have one today. Um, <laughs> So this, this is sort of one I made, we made earlier, sitting up in the crew there, seven antennas. And that's kind of what we call a pretty small telescope, but it's just a precursor to building bigger and bigger things. Um, so we have a, a telescope under construction now called Meerkat, uh, you know, very cunningly named more of the same, more of the cat telescope, which we've already built. And uh, that'll be 64 of these antennas. To give you a bit of a scale perspective, this, these antennas stand sort of 15, 16 meters high, um, you know, with their pedestal included, so they're pretty large structures. And uh, we've just started breaking ground on the, the next sort of tranche of these 64, and we should finish them like 2015 time scale, something like that. Um, that's kind of what it looks like on the ground at the moment. There's a whole lot of construction work going on, building roads, building runways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there's a really nice gigapad if you want to go and have a look, um, <coughs> and you can see kind of what's happening there. Uh, we should have webcams becoming live on the site quite soon. You'll be able to sort of follow the construction. Uh, it's quite amazing how, you know, if you have a couple of hundred million lying around, what you can do in terms of bulldozers and moving earth around and changing the face of the landscape. It's, uh, it's very nice. But this is part of a, a, a path that we're following to what we call a big telescope. So, you know, we've started with seven and then 64. Uh, and our end goal is known as the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array. And... Uh, that's a telescope that, when it's finished, will have two to 3,000 of these antennas. So, you know, you can imagine just driving up there to the Karoo, and you kind of go over a hill, and suddenly there's a sea of antennas just lurking out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's pretty impressive. And so that's our kind of end goal, big telescope. But, you know, to make big telescope happen, we need, well, we, we don't need, but we get lots of big data. So again, this is a bit of a recycle joke, but it's such a pretty slide, I'd just like to leave it in. It's got lots of numbers on it, and that's cool. Anyway, it tells you that we can have a lot of data. So particularly in this case, the SKA, we're talking about roughly an exabyte of data a day that we have to do something useful with. I mean, the raw data rates are a little bit higher, but mo a lot of that we can discard. So I think about, you know, exabytes are all very well and good. This is what really brings it home for me. If we look at the difference between an XB byte and an exabyte, so if I go to my vendor and I say, vendor man, please sell me an exabyte, um, the difference between what I really wanted, which was an XB byte, is 38,004 terabyte drives. That's what gets lost just in our IEC unit catastrophes. And, you know, it's, it's a rather large amount of data we can have to do something useful with. Um, of course, Python's a solution, so no worries there. Um, <laughs> I'll get to that. Uh, 
in addition to big data, the, every, every challenge is big. So you know, I can just start up with every slide with big something, big this, blah, blah, blah. But big energy is quite an interesting one. Um, when you start building facilities at this scale, um, things that you wouldn't really have thought about as an issue start to come into play. And uh, energy consumption is certainly one of those. So we did a little study um, to look and see what is the energy cost just of moving the data from these antennas back to a central location. Because basically what you do is you have to record the signal at every location, bring it back to one point, um, and you cross multiply them all together. But some of these telescopes will be sitting on maybe you know, 2,000 kilometers away. And overall, the energy cost of just bringing that data back to one place, somewhere in the region of 16 megawatts. So you're kind of building a power station just to move your data to your sort of central processor, um, let alone powering that and everything else that you need to do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's nice challenges to have, I guess. So someone's got to figure this stuff out. Um, so how do we build such a thing? I apologize for my, maybe I'm too strident. Um, so what we need to build is big iron, of course. Um, this is personally what I think we should spend our money on. Um, you know, software and hardware and computers and so on. But I mean, if you have one of these things, I mean, just, you know, let's, like imagine hanging out the cab of that bad boy. Like, that's what I do. I drive this thing all day. It's so much better than writing software. We're definitely in the wrong profession. The kind of big iron, of course, we need is this. Um, lots of flops, lots of, you know, many, many gigabytes and terabytes of data moving around, et cetera, et cetera. So SK, the final SKA, we are talking in the region of a couple of exaflops worth of processing. Uh, which has to sit out in the desert, it has to work reliably, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not going to be mollycoddled. Um, so there's some challenges to get to, uh, you know, to make that, uh, to make it work and work well. If you go to the vendors, this is what they'll sell you. Big, serious computers. You go to IBM and they'll say, ha ha, I have this for you. It's a proper computer. It's blue and flashy and nice. And um, the problem with these kind of traditional computers, to some extent, what I call a traditional computer, um, is for our problem, particularly for astronomy, they're quite misfocused. Um, for us, flops are not really the issue. Uh, it's getting a decent Amdahl ratio, which is having a good number of bits of I.O. for each of your flops. Um, is to try and balance the load of I.O. coming into your machine and the number of flops. So one of the things we can do is we can start to look at, say, well, where is the industry driving this, this stuff? So certainly, in my opinion, the rise of the SOC, uh, you know, everyone's carrying around these supercomputers these days, effectively. Uh, what's particularly interesting about the SOCs is that you have a relatively small number of flops and a relatively large number of IOs. I mean, there's a, there's a part from Freescale we're using that's got four 40 gig interfaces and only about 100 gigaflops of processing power. So that's a really interesting kind of computing part. And uh, one of the things we're investigating is taking a whole bunch of those and throwing them in, the, in a box, essentially. Um, and uh, you can take a couple of thousand of these because they're so low power. You put them in a nice oil... Sh is that me? Someone else? <laughs> Sorry. You throw those into an, an oil bath and then you kind of seal it up and weld it shut and then drop it out of plane and leave it in the desert to sort of suffer along in silence. But um, because it's so low power, it's very easy to build infrastructure around these things to, to make it work. Oops. We also need big storage, obviously. Um, so Meerkat, we've got a, you know, we'll have like 10 petabytes or so, which is pretty straightforward and easy enough to handle. The SKA will need an exabyte of, of storage. Uh, I put the old tape there because, you know, tape is, tape is wonderful. It's the way of the future. I tell all the youngsters, you should get into tape. Tape is the way. Um, and, the re you know, tape is beautiful because it's no what's. You know, you throw your data on it, then you leave it in the cupboard for 10 years, and then you get it again. Um, and it, it's possibly still working. But, uh, you know, compared to your spinning disks, you should try as a good experiment. Take your disk, shut it down, leave it for 10 years, start it up again, and then let me know the results. But the results are that it will fail. Um, they don't like being left around doing nothing, those disks. However... I was trawling eBay the other day, and Exabyte for $20. It was sold, but I, you know, I'm hopeful that there'll be another one along shortly. So, yeah, we probably don't need to worry too much about, uh, about the Exabyte. Right, images, stage two. So, now, has my cluster started? Oh, nada. The thing is still running. That's fine. No problem. I shall waffle on regardless. Let's go back and talk. Do. Remind me to come back to that shortly. So, big software. Okay, so now you guys are all falling asleep with hardware and crapping on about astronomy. Software time, we can talk a little bit about that. Obviously, if we're going to build big software, we should choose the language, the lingua franca of big software, which is obviously COBOL. 200 billion lines of COBOL, can't be wrong. Um, yeah, I, 
I don't know what we're doing with Python because, you know, clearly the tide is against us. Um, punch cards, it's fantastic. So this is the software problem we need to, need to solve, basically. Um, it's nice to put an equation in and a box full of magic. So, you know, the, the magic is what we're trying to figure out at the moment. Essentially what we need to do is um, our telescope measures, an ideal, it measures, a, uh, measures the ideal sky in a very corrupted way. Uh, if we had lots and lots of money and lots and lots of time, we could build a really big facility that basically tiled the ground with receptors. So instead of having a dish here and a dish over there and a dish over there yonder, you would just build you know, massive dishes everywhere and you'd capture all the signals that you were interested in and you wouldn't have, well, you'd have fewer problems. Because we build this kind of sparse array, uh, we're effectively subsampling our, our, our problem um, and that introduces quite a lot of, lot of issues. So, our task essentially is to unwind all these effects um, that we have, and there's a multitude of effects, everything, you know, you breathe on the telescope wrong, there's some new effect you have to take <coughs> into account. Uh, but essentially that's why all our IO and flops and kilowatts and dollars go into, uh, you know, fixing this equation so that the things we measure can be equated back to the, the ideal case. And that's primarily in, in radio telescopes these days, primarily is a software challenge. So. I always put David's quote here because it's just the best quote we've ever heard. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's how it is. I, I, my quote would probably be, I'm too stupid to write C++, but, you know, it sounds better to say life is too short to write C++. Certainly templated C++, you know, not for me. So this is our kind of philosophy that we have um, to combat the malaise of big software because as soon as you start saying to someone, I'm going to write big software, then again, those serious people in the lab coats come out and they say, you know, you need 50,000 million people to write this software because it's going to cost so much money and this, that, and the other thing. Um, so, you know, we sort of try to stick to some of these, these principles. I think um, optimizing last is probably my favorite amongst all of those. Uh, I think what optimizing last tells you is that uh, there's too much assumption about my problem is going to be intractable and it's going to be too difficult and I must immediately start writing in assembler, you know, because just can't be solved, you know, I need to, uh, you know, I've got to do a regular expression on this long, long string, it's going to be too slow. Uh, so the idea with Optimize Last is to say, well, you know, put your good ideas in place, prototype them quickly, it's very agile and rapid, and, you know, this is nothing new, but um, it's, it does go to language choice quite a bit for me, in that, you know, choosing a high-level language up front is saying, okay, I'm going to optimize later, I'm not going to optimize up front, I'm not going to assume the problem is too difficult to do, let me actually have some real numbers that prove my problem is too difficult with my current tool set and, uh, and go on from there. I'm going to quickly see what the state is. Woohoo, cluster is up and running. So let me do that. And apologies for the copy and paste. I know this is all very non slicky. Right. Do, 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 do. Uh, one little one. Let's see. Everyone hold thumbs. Whoops. Let's try that again. Whoops. Wait. Wait, wait, no. Aha. Keys. Always forget about the city key. There we go. Sweet. And did nervous tension too much. Ah, look at that. Spectacular. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start this. Uh, reduction, and then I'll come back at the end and talk a little bit about what it's what it's all about. Essentially, what we're trying to demonstrate here is kind of live, real-time reduction of real Cat7 data into a useful image um, using AWS, uh, and, and specifically the notebook, because the notebook is just awesome. Uh, let's run all that. Okay, back to the talk. So we'll see what happens in the background. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is preaching to the choir, of course, but I put these slides in here because, particularly in radio astronomy, whenever we tell a radio astronomer person that we're going to use Python, they're like, rah, 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 rah. So I put these slides together to sort of, you know, anti rah, rah, rah them. But, you know, Python is obviously, it's slow. No, 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 no. It's really, really, really terribly slow. Um, mostly it's, you know, it's a signal and antenna type issue. I should put an Android phone there, I guess, you know, to be an equal opportunity, uh, uh, something or other. But anyway, it works for now. Um, Obviously, you know, it's just a matter of how you use the tools you have at your hand. You know, if you use the thing in the wrong way, it's just not going to work well. And uh, it's just thinking about your problem in, in, in the right kind of way and using the right kind of tools. 
So I always put this up here as a, as, a, as a kind of a teaser for the guys because I know what's coming next, and so I have a slide I don't even need to talk. It's like, yes, I know it's C, but I didn't have to write any C, which is fantastic. And um, yes, you know, I, my KLOC count is down compared to all the other people who write reams of code, but that's okay, I don't get paid by the KLOC. I don't know what the metric is, but you know, there's some other metric that, uh, that we can use. Um, obviously, we're still a little bit slower than C, but Again, this comes to this kind of like optimized last, optimized first type deba debate. And, um, you know, for me, it's not really particularly about the language, that uh, it's how you use it and, and what you're trying to get. So you've got to ask yourself all the time, how fast do we actually need to be? And um, in our domain, that's our CPU, you know, the future prime minister. Um, he has his way. And uh, it's mostly sitting there doing bugger all, just waiting for some data, yawning, laughing at us, you know. Eight cores in your cell phone is really, this is it. It's just ridiculous. What the heck's going on? Um, so a particular radio astronomy problem is, uh, is, is gridding. So uh, our data, we collect on an irregular grid, and we want to FFT it um, so that we can, well, we want to regularize the grid so we can FFT it. You know, DFT is going to be too expensive. And uh, so we spend a lot of compute cycles on uh, regridding our data. Uh, in that process of regridding, we make use of uh, the convolution kernel to do some, uh, you know, do some fixing of some of the effects we were talking about earlier. Essentially, the bottom line is though, is that the gridding is a pretty simple process. So if we look at a relatively modern CPU, obviously a 2690 is pretty old these days, but you know we need around 64 gigabits a second to keep this core busy, and that's quite challenging. That's actually supposed to be gigabytes a second. So I was falling asleep last night, it was ridiculous. Big B there, read it everyone. Um, so you need lots and lots of data to keep the CPU maximally, maximally fed, and you know, rea in reality we probably have an order of magnitude there. So there's the outrageous claim of the day, if our R is efficient we can sacrifice an order of magnitude in performance in the CPU. Essentially what I'm saying there is that as long as we are making the bits that are bottlenecking us efficient, the rest of the time we can afford to uh, uh, save money effectively on developer time, um, and you know, spend it elsewhere that will uh, give you better bang for your buck. So is our I.O. efficient? Yes, I assert boldly. Uh, there, I had a whole 10 slide debate on proving, well not debate, but a whole 10 slide diatribe on proving our I.O. is efficient, but basically just trust me, um, the I.O. we're doing is with Python is pretty efficient um, and there's quite a lot of tricks you can do to, to make it so. Um, but I think fundamentally, and people, you know, other people who know a lot more about this will talk about this further today. I think there's a talk on, on, on Bitcode. Um, you know, it's not really about the language. Uh, you know, a lot of it looks pretty similar underneath. It's about getting to efficient Bitcode. Uh, and uh, it's having an expressive and high enough level language that you can quickly get to decent Bitcode. And I think as we move into the future, if, if you look at the success of LLVM, you know, we're really getting to the stage where we're going to be language pretty agnostic. Uh, you're going to write your language and whatever, you know, write your top level code, whatever you want, and then you'll compile it and, you know, you'll let LLVM take care of running it on your GPU or your, you know, many cores you on fire, whatever the, st the story is. I think we're kind of moving on from this, this whole, like, you've got to have your language is so specific to the task you're trying to solve. <coughs> and I think that's pretty exciting for us, and I think it offers up, uh, you know, a good advantages. So as I said, you know, for us, in, in many ways, our biggest cost is development time, not hardware. And especially if you look at it over a, a good span of years, um, our Dutch colleagues have just done a, uh, an experiment where they've, well, not an experiment, they were forced to do it because their uh, blue gene that they were using uh, ran out of warranty and licenses, and then it just explodes, I think, when the license expires or something. Anyway, they had to stop using it, so they built a, a, a GPU-based solution, and two-thirds of their budget went on development and only one-third on hardware. Um, and that's because they're writing the stuff mostly in OpenCL, which is, as you know, those have used it, it's a pretty challenging language to write a lot of big software in. So, onto ourselves in SKS Africa. So, we're quite a heavy Python shop, so I show the usual cloud of logos we, you know, that we use. Um, we're a fairly equal opportunity. We use sort of pretty much everything and anything that's going. And we use Python pretty extensively, um, you know, through our, our telescope. Uh, Indeed, our hovercraft is full of eels, um, you know, from the control system down. So we really try and we try push Python into many areas that people would say are non-traditional in this kind of environment. Um, so we don't just have it as a kind of scripting glue framework. We have a lot of our code and more and more all the time um, that we're rewriting uh, in Python. We're taking old astronomy code and... Uh, and finding that because the, you know, especially this legacy code is so complicated and has such a long tortured history, that even though the individual, you know, on a line by line basis, that code is pretty fast, taken as a whole, as a big software package, it's actually pretty slow. 
and uh, you can find that you can actually do pretty, you can be very competitive rewriting that stuff in Python um, just because the, you know, the expressiveness and the syntax that you're able to use um, lets you write that much simpler code and it's much easier to debug as well. Um, so, you know, our control system, uh, we've been using IPython for a long time since kind of day dot. Uh, we showed a demo of this last year at, at PyCon uh, where, you know, we connected live to the telescope and you controlled it. What's quite nice is it's, uh, it's kind of an, an introspective based system, so there's no static configuration about what's out there. Rather, you connect to devices and you figure out on, in sort of real time and on the fly what's, what's available to, to be used. Um, and that's worked very well in terms of an emerging and developing telescope. Uh, even things like our data transport, you know, I mean, we have obviously C implementation of this, we have an FPGA version, but fundamentally it looks like we're moving NumPy arrays around. We use the NumPy header syntax in our, in our data transport. And it's really nice because it, sorry, I'm just going to drink water. It lets you glue everything together um, <coughs> very efficiently, a whole range of disparate architectures. <coughs> All right. Time to see what's happening. So, let us go. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't say kernel busy anymore, which is good. And, aha, there we go. Okay, so let me tell you what happened here. That was what was supposed to happen. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so. <laughs> okay, I'm just loading up this other notebook. So, how many, how many are using the notebook actively around here? Just a couple. I mean, it, it's probably more relevant to the kind of stuff that we do, but I would encourage people to use the notebook. It's just a fantastic tool for sharing and developing and. Um, you know, if you, if you use IPython at all, you really should be using the notebook. It just adds a whole lot of extra, uh, extra niceness to things. So one of the things that we're trying to do, and I'm particularly interested in, is uh, reproducible science. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is something that uh, in, our, uh, in our regime hasn't really been sort of thought about well enough in the past. Uh, people will publish a paper uh, with some scientific results in it, and... Um, if you want to reproduce those results, either as an independent person or even if you want to re reproduce your own, uh, your own science, it's often a major challenge. Uh, you've got to go back and think, you know, what version of software did I use? What were my configuration files like? What script did I use? Uh, where's that data? You know, does it even exist anymore, the data I used? And so <clears throat> I think the notebook is a, is a great tool for, for exploring that idea of, of open and reproducible science. And what, we've, what I've tried to do here with this demo, and I'll, I'll step you through what we've done, is basically written up a CAT7 data reduction um, in a notebook. And uh, there's a fair bit of serial stuff in here that still happens. Um, <coughs> we haven't, you know, we're in the process of, of parallelizing everything as we go. But uh, basically it takes a, a, a raw data set, a real raw data set from CAT7, uh, performs a whole lot of calibration steps on it, and then does a parallel imaging run, um, and we parallelize it across frequency, and produces the, the sort of the thing that produces is the, the final product that we would give to scientists. And the idea with this, and what's hopefully cool, is that all you need is things like what AMI did I use? I mean, this is Amazon specific; it could be anything, obviously. You know, if you know the AMI that you used and the EBS volume that your data was on, and the idea is the notebook would be in GitHub, then you can go and you can check out what someone else did. You can check out their scientific paper effectively and you can rerun it at your own leisure. You can change parameters, you can tweak things, you can see intermediate results, etc., etc. And the idea will be that every product we produce out of, out of Meerkat and possibly the SKA, all the science that we produce won't just come with a single image. It'll come with this full infrastructure around it. So the full notebook showing exactly what went into making this, this product. And hopefully that introduces a much more sort of open environment to, to the science we're doing. And so it allows me to come back and say, oh, I made a mistake, I can tweak a parameter, rerun it, and off I go. It also allows, as I said, you know, independent people to come and uh, come and have a look. So I'll just, you know, go through a little bit. There's a lot of initial setup here. You know, laugh at my code, please, because it was all written in a rather much of a hurry. Um, so the first thing we do is we look for a bunch of, uh, of calibrator sources. Um, so these are things that are known in the sky. So when you do an observation, and you get some data, what you need to do is you need to bootstrap that data. So you need to know, okay, that particular thing that I can see, that's well known. People know all about it, they know how strong it is, they know its characteristics. You know, can you use that and apply it to the rest of the data to make sure that everything, uh, you know, all the sort of 
the measured power levels you get out uh, make sense. I should put this bottle down before I throw it somewhere. Um, sorry. So then there's an ingest phase where we take our, our native data format, we use HDF5 at the moment to store our visibility data, and we do a whole bunch of things to it um, and effectively load it into this framework that we're using. Uh, underneath here, there's a whole lot of horrible code, so uh, you know, don't look too, in too much detail. It's, not, it's, not, you know, it's obviously not Python all the way down yet, but you know, it's, it's sort of getting that way. Uh, then we do a whole sequence of, of excision and flagging. Uh, so as I mentioned, there, you know, there's sort of there's these nominal baddies out there that, that uh, you know, infect your observation and you know, try to wreck the science you're trying to do. And so we go through our data and we have a look for uh, these sources of interference. So we flag out, right, you know, a GPS satellite has gone overhead. So we've seen that, we've taken it out of our data, and now we don't have to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, someone is using a cell phone, whatever the case might be, something that's gone wrong with our data. So we do that uh, sequence of flagging, and um, that's kind of what we get when we look at our, our raw data. So that's... Uh, looking at a few of the, the baselines. So a baseline is what you've, the, the signal you've recorded between any pair of antennas. So you can see here this is antenna six with all the other antennas um, for the CAT7 array. <clears throat> this is a plot of frequency on the bottom um, and a relative power level over here and the top plot here is, uh, is phase. Uh, so this is showing you that across your, your band, so you record data across a certain, uh, a certain frequency range, you can see it's very lumpy and ripply. Um, you can also see that this phase plot up top here, this is, you know, if you look at the scale here, zero to 100 degrees is quite a movement in phase across the band. So that's stuff we need to take out and, and calibrate. So we do a delay calibration, then we do a band pass calibration. Band pass calibration essentially says, right, there's a big source over there, and I know that it has a band shape that's flat, or I know it very well. I can then use that to take out this ripple in my data, which is just introduced by the telescope and not actually part of, uh, part of the problem. So you can see here now we've flattened this band pass. It still has a slope because the, these sources have a spectral index. Basically, you know, as you change frequency, the, the power received from that source changes. But it's, you know, much more, it's much better behaved and well constrained when we go through these calibration phase. Then we do an amplitude and phase calibration. That tries to normalize all the levels that, um, that we have, and we uh, you know, correct all these uh, so-called fluxes, all these, uh, these power, the collect these powers we uh, compare them to, this, uh, to the source that we're interested in. And uh, basically then there's a pre-imaging step that, that goes. So what I ran here now was that, that parallel imaging. So I'm using the IPython parallel framework, which is very good. Um, it's, you know, it's progressed a lot over the years, and you know, we use it uh, reasonably extensively, and uh, we're using it more and more as we go. There's a whole lot of setup that happens. Um, there's you know, any number of parameters that go into our, our imaging. So the, this is kind of the area where when people come and they look at your observation or there's something that you know, hasn't worked out quite, well, quite right, you can come here and you can change these parameters and then fairly trivially rerun things and get a different result. Um, so there's a whole lot of parameters that won't go into, into all the details of those. Um, use a little bit of scatter, send some, some seeds out to the, the various engines that I'm using. Um, I look to see if my data is making sense. Uh, so this I just print out per node, you know, the, the data I'm interested in looking at. As I said, this was... Um, our original glorious plan was for you know, hundreds or thousands of nodes in parallel. So for those of you who've been paying attention, we'll notice that I only used 15, which is kind of the Achilles heel of the, the allegedly glorious demo. But um, you know, if it works for 15, it'll work for 1,000. Hey? I mean, simple scaling, no problems there. Um, I, I promise you next year I'll have a fully-fledged AWS account, and then I'll try to run it on 1,000 nodes, and we'll see how it happens. Um, then we do some, some, some further calibration. So this, is these, this calibration gets done on um, uh, the individual bands we're looking at. So what, we did, what we've done now, as I said, we split it across frequency to give ourselves a, a, an axis of parallelization, and we're now looking at, uh, at the individual bands um, as we go and calibrating those further. Then we set up the imaging task, and that's the, that's the sort of main uh, meats and bones of the thing. It actually runs pretty fast. I mean, I'm only running this on, on T1 micro nodes, uh, which are pretty limited, but uh, given that we've you know, parallelized our data quite heavily, this was originally uh, about a 10 gigabyte data set or so, and uh, you know the imaging probably only took a couple of minutes um, to do in, in, in parallel, which is pretty good. And this basically then shows you what I do is you generate all these, uh, these individual frames in parallel. And this is the image of the first and the last frames from that data set. They look pretty similar because we don't expect this field to change much with frequency. 
Um, and then we take those individual frames and we average them and glue them together. And you can see that's, uh, that's what came up. I should have showed you beforehand that there were no results in this before I ran it, um, just to prove that it actually did run uh, live and stuff actually happened. Um, I can show you my EC2 management page. Let's see, there's some proof that things are actually real. <laughs> show me the proof, show me the proof. Maybe, maybe not, maybe that's a bad idea. Um, anyway, so now what we do is this notebook now can get saved up as it is. And what's, one of the things that's really cool is, um, let's just open this. Is you can take that notebook and you can turn it into a PDF. And you can basically take your reduction that you've done and you can write your, you know, you can write your paper. You can include, uh, you know, math text stuff in here. I shall tell you about the spots. It's a good question. Um, so you can basically take that notebook and make your paper straight off. This is just a simple NB convert. It makes a pretty good looking uh, PDF that has all the explanation of what you did, as well as the code, as well as the results. So kind of everything's in one place. There's no like, my code is here, my results are here, my explanation is here. It's all kind of mingled in together. And I think this is going to be, you know, for the future, I think it's going to be a pretty powerful, uh, powerful tool. Um, there we go. Some nodes are actually running and burning time. Um, yeah, I should have talked about this field a little bit further. So this is um, a field we observe quite regularly. It's called, we call it deep one, which gives it a you know, sinister overtones. But um, essentially, it's just a fairly nearly blank patch of sky that we use to test out how deeply we can observe. So these sources here are kind of at the observing limit of what we can see with Cat7 in a reasonable length of time. This is about 10 hours of observation. Um, these are just... Uh, very distant compact radio sources, and they're kind of a couple of couple of millijansky, so you know they're very small, and uh, um, it's a nice testing field because some of them are quite close together. If you know if I if I spent more time on this image and, uh, and did it properly, you'd see that there are about a hundred sources in there um, altogether. And uh, again, there's a little explanation in the other notebook um, about the field and uh, something here about the field and the observation. Here we go. Um, roughly 120 distinct radio sources. Uh, so these are galaxies with uh, big black holes in them. So those, you know, these are far away objects with, you know, containing millions of stars themselves. Um, cool, okay, so let's go back, I think. And right, so basically, that's, uh, that's what I had to, <laughs> had to show. Uh, Jacob Zuma says, come and visit the SKA. I give it the thumbs up. Here we are. Um, but it's a really cool project, and I think what's nice about it is it's, uh, you know, it's the South African government putting a lot of money into primary science, and um, it's, you know, in, in the sort of eight years I've been doing, working for this project, we've come a heck of a long way, particularly internationally, where when we started doing this, you would go overseas and say, I'm a radio astronomer from South Africa, and people would be like, oh, what are you doing? You don't even have electricity and email. And it's like, but I just emailed you yesterday. People, <laughs> what are you talking about? And, um, you know, now we go and people are like, yeah, radio astronomy from Africa, this is really cool. And, uh, you know, we get to play with a lot of the big tech leaders and, you know, bring ideas back here and take ideas from here elsewhere. And I think it's really proved that, you know, South Africans, you know, we have a strong community here. I'm, you know, I was amazed last year at PyCon 2012 at how many people are, you know, sort of using Python and doing development in the Western Cape and, and in South Africa. It was, it was really cool. And uh, it's really good to see, you know, so many people here. Um, I will use this as a little punch to put out like a call to action. We, we, have, we have positions. Everyone always seems to say that at the end of their talks. We're hiring. So I thought I'd start off that process and everyone else can follow that. So, you know, we are hiring. Um, we're always looking for like, you know, really like go gettery, Python-y, tinkery, codery, hackery, build hardware, whatever you want to do, kind of there's, there's something, something we need to do. Um, so come along, uh, you know, give me a, drop me an email. Come, you, welcome to visit our offices, see what we're doing. Uh, there's, there's lots of cool opportunities for things. And um, yeah, I'm a little bit short, but uh, thanks for the time. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah. That's it. Uh, we're going to do questions. Time for uh, one question um, or two. Um, it's almost tea time. Um, so if you have a question, raise up your hand really quickly. Um, okay, that hand right at the back, and this hand 
here in the second row. Um, Charlotte, do you want the mic? Uh, I'll just repeat the question. Uh, the person who put up their hand over here. Yeah, you, uh, now known as hand one. Um, the, the question was how far away are those, uh, those, those galaxies that we saw in the, in, in the, in the picture there. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the, the exact distance. Um, Tom, do you know? Halfway to the edge of the world. Halfway to the edge of the So, you know, billions of light years away. So, five, six, seven billion light years uh, distant, uh, which is obviously pretty cool. So, you got to see it happening live here today. Halfway to the edge of the universe and, and back. <laughs> Um, so, as you say, our, our data flow involves a, a kind of number of hybrid kind of technologies. So we have, we sample as early as we can. And so for Meerkat, our sampler is actually at the feed of the antenna. We digitize straight away. Um, from there, it comes over 40 gig Ethernet. Um, that's currently what we're using. The main reason for that is that uh, our digitizer and our correlator are FPGA based. And uh, gigabit Ethernet or 10 gig Ethernet cores are quite a lot simpler to make uh, in VHDL than uh, InfiniBand. So, Although InfiniBand would offer us some advantages, particularly the RDMA capabilities. Uh, we currently are Ethernet up until our correlator device. Post-correlator, where we get into kind of more commodity hardware, at the moment we've got a toss-up between Ethernet and InfiniBand for that. Um, or are you using a bit of our back space there on your, on your topics? So, we're, we're, we're fortunate in that because <coughs> we can parallelize our problem quite substantially, um, and we don't have a lot of cross-talk for example, that imaging runner did, you know, that's, that's completely parallel. And so that does let us, we don't have to have a, a large kind of very high speed mesh fabric. Most of it is quite this kind of simple router and then serial out uh, along, a, along a couple of nodes. So, yeah, we very much stream it out. I mean, we do need to look at the data in real time. So, you know, that's why we fall under the horrendous big data moniker because, you know, we have data and we can't, you know, we can't really store it for, for too long. Um, but I think, you know, particularly with, uh, with you know, 100 gig, InfiniBand basically here and working well, uh, you know, for the next five, six years, it looks pretty, pretty doable for us. Um, I think when we see more, more accelerated technology that goes in socket as well, um, particularly with dedicated PCI Express links, that's going to be quite helpful for us. At the moment, you know, if we use something like a GPU, obviously we waste a lot of time moving data across the PCI Express link. One last thing hmm. on We, we've, we said, we, we've looked at them. We don't currently have a need. We use, at the moment, I, I mostly use Chelsea Omex um, and, uh, and some Mellanox stuff for the Infiniband. Band. And both of those have got pretty good access to the offload engine if you want to do something tricky there. But most of, the, most of our data, is, it's all UDP, and uh, we just basically zero copy it straight out, either into GPU memory or, uh, or into, into sort of kernel space, and then do things with it there. We don't really need to do a lot on the NIC at the moment, yeah. Cool. I'd like just to thank Simon again. This really is an incredible project, and it's awesome to see so much of it being done in Python and to see it happening right here in South Africa. Um, if you have more questions for Simon, there is a tea break right now. There we go. Um, and he'll be there, and <laughs> you can all pounce on him at once. <laughs> um, uh, now that Simon has finished his demo, I can tell you all that there is free Wi Fi available. Thank you, RSA Web. Yay. Uh, okay, from RSA Web. Uh, the access point doesn't have a password, and its name is RSA Web Free Wi Fi. Um, if you're a speaker, there's also a speaker's room if you need somewhere quiet to sit down and to prepare your slides. Um, yeah, otherwise, everyone enjoy tea. <laughs> <laughs>